everyone, in this video I'm going to continue talking about the notion of rights. Specifically herein, we're going to look at the thought that comes out of the middle of the 17th century following the execution of King Charles I, and this thought is referred to as social contract theory. Specifically, we're going to take a look at the thought of the English thinkers Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, and then we'll also look at a little bit of the Swiss thinker Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and then we'll continue where this thought influences the very drafting of the American Declaration of Independence. Let's get into it. So Thomas Hobbes, English thinker, living at the time in which Charles I, King of England, had been executed for treason, wonders, how do we get to this point? What is the nature of the world? And he says this, conceiving of nature, like if we rewind back in time, hypothetically, how do governments start? How do rights begin? And he says this, if we just went back in time before there were any governments, here's the scenario. Nature hath made men so equal in all the faculties of body and mind as that though there be found one man sometimes manifestly stronger in body or quicker in mind than another, yet when all is reckoned together, the difference between man and man is not so considerable as that one man can thereupon claim himself any benefit to which another may not pretend as well as he. In short, in nature, everybody's equal. And what we have here is a thought experiment called the state of nature. If we could rewind back in time before there were any governments or anything, what do we see? We see this thing called the state of nature. Did it ever really happen in time? Probably not. But if we could rewind back, we would see that if there were no governments, if there were no overarching hierarchies, in a state of nature, everybody's equal. You may think that sounds good, but it's not. Because he says, hereby, it is manifest that during the time men live without a common power, if there were no government to keep them all in awe, they are in a condition that is called war, and such a war as of every man against every man. For war consists not in battle only, or the act of fighting, but in a tract of time, wherein the will to contend by battle is sufficiently known, and therefore the notion of time is to be considered in the nature of war, as it is in the nature of weather. For as the nature of foul weather lieth not in shower or two of rain, but in an inclination thereto of many days together. So the nature of war consisteth not in actual fighting, but in the known disposition there too, during all the time, there is no assurance to the contrary, all other time is peace. So, humanity, if there were no government, would be all war. He says further, whatsoever therefore is consequent to a time of war, where every man is enemy to every man, the same is consequent to the time, where men live without other security, than what their own strength and their own invention shall furnish them withal. In such condition there is no place for industry, because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation or use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving, and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man solitary poor nasty brutish and short so what hobbes is saying here is that if we could rewind time backwards if there were no governments we'd see that everybody would be fighting everybody else it would be a constant competition nothing would get done there'd be no art, there'd be no industry, there'd be no business, there'd be no production, there'd be nothing but conflict between individuals. There are no rights, there is only power and force. And so what Hobbes later says is that what we do is that we come up with governments, we come up with systems in order to suppress our own freedoms, because in our own freedom, we're all just fighting each other all the time. And we come together to make a kind of mutual agreement under a sovereign where we say, you know what, it's bad that we're all just looking out for ourselves. So we come up with governments and systems where we say, you know what, I'm gonna give up a little bit of my freedom to the sovereign so that we're all working in unison together. But this is a pessimistic outlook. Whereas, even though Charles I was executed, Charles II, his son, comes to power, fairly popular king. James II then comes to power, not a popular king, Catholic. He gets repudiated. He actually gets expelled from the kingdom, not executed. And his daughter, Mary, and Mary's husband, William of Orange, become the king and queen of England, William and Mary. And thus, England gets a new king and queen fairly painlessly, all things considered. This is called the Glorious Revolution of 1688. And therefore, thinkers a little bit after Hobbes have a little bit more of a positive view, like that of John Locke. Let's take a look. 
So John Locke comes a little bit later than Thomas Hobbes, and he also describes the same phenomenon. If we could rewind back in time to the state of nature, looking at the origin story of governments and humanity, what would it look like? Is it nasty, brutish, and short, like Hobbes said? Let's see. He says, to understand political power right and derive it from its original, we must consider what state of men are naturally in, and that is a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit within the bounds of the law of nature without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. A state also of equality wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal, no one having more than another, there being nothing more evident than the creatures of the same species and rank promiscuously born to all the same advantages of nature and the use of the same faculties should also be equal one amongst another without subordination or subjection unless the lord and master of them all should by any manifest declaration of his will set one above another and confer on him by an evident and clear appointment an undoubted right to dominion and sovereignty. So Locke says, if we rewind back in time, it's not nasty, brutish, and short. There would be, hypothetically, a period in time, if we could rewind back before there were any governments or anything, everybody's completely equal, just there's absolute equality, and everybody has their stuff. And they kind of get along, but they're in their own little spheres of dominion, but everybody's equal. And he says here, but though this be a state of liberty, yet it is not a state of license. You can't do whatever you want, even though you think you could. Though man in that state have uncontrollable liberty to dispose of his persons and possessions, yet he has not liberty to destroy himself or so much as any creature in his possession, but where some nobler use in its bare preservation calls for it. Further, he says, and that all men may be restrained from invading others rights and from doing hurt to one another and the law of nature be observed which willeth the peace and preservation of all mankind the execution of the law of nature is in that state put into every man's hands whereby everyone has a right to punish the transgressors of the law to such a degree as may hinder its violation for the law of nature would as all other laws that concern men in the world be in vain if there were nobody in that state of nature had a power to execute that law and thereby preserve the innocent and restrain the offenders. So in a state of nature, before there were any governments, everybody would be looking out for themselves, surely, but they would also be trying to preserve their own individual environments by any means necessary, not encroaching upon others, but taking care of the stuff that they had themselves. And so, that leads Locke to this conclusion. God having made man such a creature that in his own judgment it was not good for him to be alone, put him under strong obligations of necessity, convenience, and inclination to drive him into society, as well as fitted him with understanding and language to continue and enjoy it. The first society was between man and wife, which gave beginning to that between parents and children, to which in time that between master and servant came to be added, and though all these might and commonly did meet together and make up but one family, wherein the master or mistress of it had some sort of rule proper to family, each of these or all together came short of political society, as we shall see if we consider the different ends, ties, and bounds of each of these. So what Locke is saying here is that if we imagine a world in the past, hypothetically, where every it's every man for himself, so to speak, whereas Hobbes was saying everybody would fight each other and everybody's in fear of each other, and so what we do is we form governments and societies to kind of make like a deal with each other. Like, okay, look, I won't hurt you if you won't hurt me. Like, are we friends now? Maybe not friends, but can we at least form an alliance? Okay, fine, like I still hate you, but now we've come up with a kind of mutual agreement where we're not going to harm each other. For Locke, it's, okay, everybody independently is kind of doing their own thing, and that's fine. And what society is, is where we all gradually come together. And yeah, still, like Hobbes said, we do give up little bits of our freedom for some kind of corporate freedom so we can do more stuff together. It's much more optimistic than Hobbes, and of course, Locke is living after the restoration of the English throne, whereas Hobbes was not. So Hobbes lived in a world where kings got their heads cut off, and Locke is not, and so they might have different views on a pessimism or optimism about humanity from that. But Locke says, 
conjugal society is made by a voluntary compact between man and woman, and though it consists chiefly in such a communion and right one in another's bodies as is necessary to its chief end, producing offspring, procreation, yet it draws with its mutual support and assistance and a communion of interest too, as necessary not only to unite their care and affection, but also necessary to their common offspring, who have a right to be nourished and maintained by them till they are able to provide for themselves. What Locke is saying here is that the basic fundamental block, the atom of society, is the family. It is, for Locke, the man and the woman coming together to produce offspring, and what society is, or governments are, is just an extension of that. Which is why he says, whenever therefore any number of men are so united into one society as to quit everyone his own executive power of the law of nature, and to resign it to the public, there and there only is a political or civil society. So if we go back to the state of nature, everybody is the king of their own little domicile i'm a ruler you're a ruler we're all rulers of our own little domains we have limitations in that we can only do so much in our own little tiny kingdoms and so what Locke says is we come together to form alliances to do more stuff and what that is called is political or civil society we give up being our own little independent sovereigns and say you know what i'll allow some cooperation, I will give up some of my freedom, which is why I can yield to a sovereign like a king, because we're trying to work together. That's how society forms according to Locke. This is why Locke says in page 102 of your reading, the state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, which obliges everyone. And reason, which is the law, teaches all mankind who will but consult it that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. For men, being all the workmanship of one omnipotent and infinitely wise maker, all the servants of one sovereign master, sent into the world by his order and about his business, they are his property, whose workmanship they are, made to last during his, not another's pleasure, and being furnished with like faculties, sharing all all in one community of nature, there cannot be supposed any such subordination among us that may authorize us to destroy another as if we were made for one another's uses, as the inferior ranks of creatures are for ours. Saying we can use animals, we're not like that. It's not like we can use deer skin or we can use cow meat or something like that. Humans aren't like that. We're equal. Everyone, as he is bound to preserve himself and not to quit his station willfully, so by the like reason, when his own preservation comes not in competition, ought he, as much as he can, to preserve the rest of mankind, and may not, unless it be to do justice to an offender, take away or impair, or what tends to the preservation of life, the liberty, the health, the limb, or goods of another. Two things there I want to point out. First of all, you're not allowed, according to Locke, in this view, to injure another unless there's some grievance involved. You can't just decide, oh, I want to kill my neighbor because I want to take their stuff. No, you can't do that. Even in this limited society that we have here, if we were to rewind back in time, notice what he says. What rights do people have in themselves? This final notion, the preservation of life, liberty, health, limb, or goods of another. I'm going to go ahead and tell you here, this phrasing right here is going to influence the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and so we're going to talk about pursuit of happiness, which is what the Declaration of Independence is going to say. It includes that health, limb, or goods of another. Locke says positively, when we come together in society, we expect these rights to be respected. Let's take a look at the Swiss thinker, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau, the Swiss thinker, starts by saying this, Man was born free, but everywhere he is in chains. The man believes he is the master of others. He is still more of a slave than they are. How did that transformation take place? I don't know. How may the restraints of man become legitimate? I do believe I can answer that question. Rousseau says here, unlike Hobbes and Locke, that mankind was born free, but 
now it's in chains. It's trapped. It's imprisoned in some way. How did that come about? Rousseau says he doesn't know, but he says there's a way to fix it. So let's take a look at that. He says there is a state of nature too, like Hobbes and Locke do, that there's this period we could rewind back in time to and say, how did all this stuff start? And for him, he says, in the past, human preservation must have become greater than each individual with his own strength can cope with. Kind of like Hobbes, everyone might have been fighting, but an adequate combination of forces must be the result of men coming together. Rather than being in conflict and in competition with each other, people all just came together, even though people primarily focused on self-preservation. And then he says, in reality, each individual may have one particular will as a man, what you want, but that is different from or contrary to the general will which he has as a citizen. His own particular interests may suggest other things to him than the common interest does. His separate, naturally independent existence may make him imagine that what he owes to the common cause is an incidental contribution, a contribution which will cost him more to give than their failure to receive it would harm the others. He may also regard the moral person of the state as an imaginary being, since it's not a man, and wish to enjoy the rights of a citizen without performing the duties of a subject. This unjust attitude could cause the ruin of the body politic if it became widespread enough. So what Rousseau is saying here is that what happens when we form society is that, yes, we still have our individual desires and things that we want. But when we team up as human beings, the goals of the team outweigh the goals of our individual selves. And that's what society is. Society is the teamwork of individuals. And our common goals are what we're supposed to work towards more than what our individual goals are. So at this point, you may be wondering, what does all this Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau stuff have anything to do with rights whatsoever? What all three of them are doing is telling us where rights come from. So in a natural order, what they call the state of nature, and all three of them have a notion of a state of nature, but it means something slightly different. In Hobbes, it's terrible. In Locke, it's kind of okay. And in Rousseau, it's even more benign but what we have is this in a state of nature like if we could rewind back in time to where every human being is completely equal no governments just everyone's on their own complete all against all what Hobbes says omnia bellum contra omnes a war of all against all everybody's equal we're all fighting each other there are no rights if i can take your stuff by power that's it there's no rights there's just power and so what Hobbes says is what we have our governments that step in where we give up some of our own sovereignty we give up some of our rights to the state for self-preservation purposes because then what the state does is helps all of us a little bit and it makes it a little bit easier for ourselves because we don't have to defend ourselves constantly that's Hobbes. for Locke, it's that we're all independent and it's fairly benevolent amongst each other but we still come into competition with each other and what we do is we form societies as mutual cooperatives where we give up a little bit of our rights like yeah i know i could have i could say this is all my land but i'm gonna say it's not my land it's not completely my land it's your land it's your land here and we work together to do stuff with it cooperatively and then rousseau says there's a problem with this yes we do this in the state of nature, there's complete, everybody is entirely independent, and we get together, and when we get together, sometimes society can get too complicated to the point where we've lost the plot, so to speak, on really what we owe to each other and what our rights, responsibilities, and duties are to the point that we don't know. So our rights are what are the privileges and what are the entitlements that we have? In nature, we're entitled to as much as we we can attain by force. But when the state of nature is counteracted with the advent of society, that has to be restrained. So our rights that we have are the leftovers of what we have when we give up our own independence to mutual cooperative society. Now that's true for Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau in varying degrees. Hobbes being the most pessimistic, Locke being much more optimistic, and Rousseau having a little bit of a different take altogether. Now, why do I mention these three thinkers, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, in the context of rights? That brings us now to the United States, or at least the American colonies. We come together for cooperative mutual advantage. That's the purpose of governments. 
And if that has been violated, the Americans are going to say, then it is the responsibility of the people, not the king, not the nobility, but the people. Now granted, when the Americans say the people, they still mean the landowners, but not necessarily the nobility to absolve or rid of that government because contractually it's invalid. The purpose of government is mutual cooperation. And if that cooperation is not happening, it can be dissolved. Further, the function of governments, therefore, is the preservation of individual rights for everyone. And again, for everyone here, we mean landowners. Obviously, we're not talking about slaves or women, or even non-land-owning white men. None of those people count. Look at the language of the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, notice that word entitlement, a decent respect to the opinion of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to their separation. Something has happened here wherein the Americans are saying, we are breaking up, we are divorcing ourselves from Great Britain. And they say this, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal in the state of nature, that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, that is, rights which cannot be taken away, that are bound to the person, that among these are, and they itemize them here, life, liberty, and vaguely, the pursuit of happiness. All right, let's start with this, that human beings are all equal, as they would be in a state of nature, and they are given by God, by the Creator, certain rights, life, liberty, those two seem fairly obvious, life, you can't be killed, or you shouldn't be killed, liberty, freedom to do what you want to do, at least to some extent, and the pursuit of happiness, that one's vague, but it's still that phrase echoes something that Locke said earlier in his second treatise on government. And then listen to the next part, that to secure these rights, to protect these rights, governments are instituted among men, not by God, not by kings, but governments are made by people deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That is the people who are being governed are the ones who determine what the powers are, like they would if they were coming together in the state of nature, and that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, what ends? Protecting these particular rights. It is the right of the people to alter, to change, or to abolish it, get rid of it, and to institute new government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its power in such form. What form? To these ends of preserving life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now this is the American Declaration of Independence. Now listen, this is technically not a legal document of this country. This is not law in the United States. This is historical. The Constitution is law. This is not the Constitution. This is the Declaration of Independence, wherein, in rebelling against the kingdom of Great Britain, which had already been going on since 1775, but here we are July 4th, 1776, later saying, here's why the colonies are doing what we're doing. This is our rationale to preserve these particular rights. That's why we're doing what we're doing. At least this is the claim that's going on here. So if we go all the way back to 1215, from 1215 to 1776, half a millennium, we go from saying to King John, We've got some grievances, and you need to grant us these rights. To in 1776, the American colonists saying to King George III, you're going to grant us these rights, but you're not merely going to grant them. We are going to grant them to ourselves, and you're going to allow us to do it by breaking up with us, by dissolving our bonds together. That's a different phenomenon. I want you to notice that. The earlier notions of rights were... You, the king, will give us these rights. Here, what's going on in the Declaration of Independence is we're just simply telling you that you don't have the power to give us these rights. These rights are endowed by our creator. They're there naturally. That's where we get this notion of natural rights. It doesn't begin in the Declaration of Independence. It begins in those documents of Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau, this notion of natural rights, where there are rights that we have, 
rights that are sometimes called negative rights that are we just simply have as people and these are knowable to us via reason later on sometimes these will be called human rights but negative rights are these notions or natural rights are these notions that there are rights that we simply possess as human beings they are given to us in virtue of being human maybe as the authors of the declaration say they're given to us by our creator and they are un alienable that is they cannot be made alien they cannot be made foreign they cannot be taken away from you you have them no matter what you weren't given them by some party like remember when we were talking about getting your degree and it says oh now that you've got your degree you've got all the rights and privileges appertaining there too now you've got the right or like if you're a student now you've got the right to park in a parking space and use the library now you've got the right because you have certain criteria met these rights natural rights you've got the criteria and virtue of being a human being period and therefore morality becomes are you helping me preserve my life liberty and pursuit of happiness or not am i acting in accordance with my own life liberty and pursuit of happiness at the violation of yours in which case if i'm violating someone else's rights i'm doing something wrong if you're violating my rights you're doing something wrong and so from a rights point of view morality is conducive to talking about rights and the protections of rights that we have that cannot be taken away. What I'm going to do in the next video is I'm going to talk about other notions of rights that come later. Positive rights, legal rights, welfare rights, and we're also going to look at a critique of the notion of rights altogether. That's what we'll do next time.